So good morning. It is great to see you. I, I, am, I am thoroughly enjoying the season of the year. Uh, with all the stuff that goes on and all the things that happen and all the time schedules and all the things that we have to navigate and work through and work around for the season of the year, I still enjoy it. I mean, there's so much stuff to be done, right? Anybody have stuff you have yet to be done? Yeah. I haven't started shopping yet. I'm starting to feel the pressure. The pressure's starting to build. It's kind of like, you know, in your sinuses, you can feel it, right? I just, I'm starting to feel the pressure. And, and then yesterday, it started snowing. I was like, wow, yay. And I know some of you didn't say yay. <laughs> I know that. So I went outside on my patio, and I built a fire in the fireplace on the back patio, and I did some work outside while it was snowing, and then I built a fire on the inside of the house, and then I went to Kmart to buy more lights for the Christmas tree because the lights we had didn't work, and it was that kind of a day, right? It's the stuff we do, and, and, and so here we are in the Christmas season, and one of the, one of the things we decided very clearly this year as we were celebrating the Christmas season, is that we were going to kind of turn Christmas on its head, or maybe better yet, look behind the curtain at Christmas and to see what was going on. We've talked about, last week we started talking about how beautiful the scene is and how wonderful and majestic and how pretty this, and this particular nativity is really gorgeous. And, and, and we talked about how we kind of tidy it all up, right? We put it all together. This is a mashup of maybe some of the events that we read about, some of the, the aspects of the account of the birth of Jesus. We kind of mash it all up. We kind of clean it all up, and we put it all in here. And in this particular scenario, we put glitter on everybody so that it sparkles because we just want things to sparkle, right? And so we clean it all up. And at least, in, I mean, it's this one. You probably can't notice it from back there, but the shepherd doesn't have any shoes on He's barefoot, and that's probably how they would have lived their lives. This guy here, his, his shoes have little pointy tips on them, so does his. And, you know, this is, there's some neat, but, but we tidy it all up, and this is probably not how it looked 2,000 years ago. And so what we decided to do is we decided to, to talk about that. To talk about how beautiful that is, and it's okay to do that. And, and so don't get me wrong, I think this is beautiful, but I think there's more to the story. Now, this is the, there's not more to the story like in don't, don't mind that guy behind the curtain. Wizard of Oz, right? It, it's not a hoax. It's not a, we're not, it's not a trick. It's, there's nobody behind the curtain pulling rods and levers or anything. There's, but there are some real things behind the scenes that I think it's important for us to look at so that we can see more of the story because there are some powerful things going on in this account of the birth of Jesus. And so we decided that through this, this Christmas season, we were going to kind of turn, turn and look behind the scenes a little bit to see what the depth of of meaning that was surrounding this picture. And so today we get a chance, and we also said we were going to kind of, we were going to talk about Jesus already being born and work toward Christmas to his birth. So last week we talked about Jesus, Mary, and Joseph having to flee down to Egypt. That once the baby was born, once Herod had discovered that the baby was born in Bethlehem, he made a decision to kill all of the children two years old and under. And so Joseph, in a dream, was directed to take Mary and the baby and go down to Egypt to hide, to go away until Herod was gone. Uh, we know that Herod dies in 4 BC. And so we, we figure that Jesus' birth is somewhere around either 6 BC or 4 BC, somewhere in that range, that two year range in there, somewhere. So, because we know for a fact that that's when Herod dies. And Herod dies and Jesus comes back from Egypt and they settle up near the Galilean region in a town called Nazareth, right? So we, we talked about that last week and this week, so working our way backward in the story, right? And so when we, this, today we're going to talk about these three guys, right? Known as wise men, magi, kings, Right? We sing the song, right? We three, 
Right, there you go. You, imagine, you automatically went there with me because that's the song we sing. But I think it's really going to be good for us to kind of peel back the layers and find out what's going on with the wise men. And, and the story is told that, that it was wise men because you can tell based on the gifts that they brought. Because if it, if it were wise women... They would have brought completely different gifts. They would have asked for directions, arrived on time, helped deliver the baby, cleaned up the stable, made a casserole, brought practical gifts from Babies R Us, like diapers, wipes, bibs, and formula. Am I wrong? No. Right. But it's wise men, right? (laughs) These are... Travelers. So here's what I want to do. I want to take a moment to look at these wise travelers from the East, especially what they brought with them, and, and what things we know and what things, if we can look a little deeper, if we can move some of the, the glitter out of the way and get to the reality of this story, find out exactly what's going on with these wise men. So I want to do a little bit of a Q&A with you. All right, a little bit of a question and answer kind of time with you. Now, here's the thing. Here's what you need to know. It's, it's 8.28 in the morning. You don't have to have the answers. I have them already. All right, so the Q&A doesn't, you're thinking, oh, gosh, it's a test. No, no, we're going to be all right. I'm going to give you the question, and I'm, then I'm going to give you the answer. So this is kind of an informational session for you. You're going to walk out of here with some information this morning, not just inspiration, but information. So here's the information part of our message today. So how many wise men were there? Well, we think there are three, right? Primarily because there are how many gifts? Three. But nowhere in the Bible does it say how many wise men there were. It just says there were wise men traveling from the east, right? It doesn't say how many. And we assume we make it three simply because there were three gifts, and we figure that well, maybe it was three because there were three gifts, but we don't know that for a fact. There could have been three. There could have been 50. What we know is this. The word is plural. There were wise men, not a wise man. So there was more than one. There were at least two, and there could have been a large number Easily we know this, there was a large number of travelers. As you see in this image, every one of these wise individuals riding on a camel has someone leading the camel, right? There would have been travelers, people who set the tents up, tear the tents down. There would have been a caravan. It was not safe to travel by yourself. They would have traveled in in a fairly large number, quite possibly somewhere between 10 and 50 individuals were probably on this adventure. They may have picked up individuals along the way, who were, one, curious, two, wanted to be a part of the caravan. And so, which by the way, I really love this image. This image just looks to me like maybe that's how it would have looked, right? There's just something about that imagery right there that just strikes me as maybe that's a little bit more realistic on how it looks. But even there, there's only three wise men, Right? So we don't know how many were there, but what we do in this nativity, what we do is we set three individuals so that we can set apart the three gifts, right? So that's the first thing. How many there were there? We don't know for sure. We know that in, there, there are traditions about these wise men, that where they came from. It is thought that they came from, it says that they come from the east. The east in relationship to Israel could be Iraq, could be Iran, could be Afghanistan, it could be all the way to, um, to India. It could have been pretty far away. It could have been the Orient as we know it today. Uh, the Armenian tradition says that, they are, that the Magi of Bethlehem are, have names, and they know where they came from. There, there are traditions that actually label them and say that Balthazar was from Arabia, that Melchior was from Persia, and Gaspar was from India. Now you know their names. Do you want me to say them again so you can write them down? Balthazar, Mechiar, Gaspar. Arabia, Persia, India. So how far did they travel? Well, we figure anywhere from 500 to 1,500 miles. That's not an overnight trip in that time period. It's not an overnight trip for us. It's certainly not an overnight trip when you're traveling 
by camel, setting up a tent every night, tearing it down every morning, and moving to the next spot. How long did it take? Anywhere, depending on where they came from, anywhere from two weeks to six months. We know that it could have taken up to a year, depending on where they came from, if they came all the way from someplace like India or China. So it took them quite a while to get there. It could have taken as long as a year for some of them. Why were they called wise? Why, they were, why were they called magi? Well, the terminology in the time period basically identifies anyone who is, is wise in knowledge and has wisdom and has gained that wisdom through science and astrology and astronomy. These are individuals who watch the sky. Now think about that for just a moment. If your life was reduced to no television, no newspaper, no, um, no informational input from Facebook, there's a thought that maybe we should consider. Uh, but if, if all of the news outlets are gone and you want to start finding out what's going on in the world around you, one of the places you might look is up. You might look at the sky to see what's going on because for some reason, and we know this today, right? We know that there are reasons, there are things that happen in the sky that inform us about what's coming. For example, and you know this, I'm going to tell you why you know this, I'm going to tell you how you know this because here's how you know this, red sky in morning, red sky at night, there you go. You know by looking at the sky you can judge what's coming. If, if, if there's somebody around you who doesn't understand that, make sure you explain <laughs> red sky in the morning, red sky at night. Make sure you explain that to them because those are indicators. These are individuals who watch the sky and look for the indicators that something is happening in the world around us. They believe that, there are, that, that the God of the world is controlling images in the sky that give pictures about what's coming and what the future looks like. We know that they respond to that information because they respond to a star, right? They notice that there's something unique happening in the sky. There is a star, and they see it, and they realize that, that star must represent something powerful happening in the world. It could mean the birth of a king, and so they start studying. They start looking at prophecies. They start looking at all of the different historic writings about the, what, what is to come, and they realize that this star represents what has been told in the Hebrew scriptures, that there is a king being born. But it leads to the question, why are they called kings? Why would one king go to see another? Well, Here's where that comes from. A guy by the name of Tertullian in the second century suggested that these men were king because the Old Testament predicted that kings would come to worship him. Well, what we understand is there are kings that come to worship Jesus, but mo these were not the kings themselves. They were representatives of kingdoms who were sent to pay homage to a king being born. And so we three kings from Orient are is pretty much a stretch they are representatives of kingdoms, not kings themselves. When did they arrive? When did they show up at the picture? Well, it says in here that they showed up at the house, not the stable. So when did they arrive? Well, we think that these three individuals or, or this caravan did not show up probably at the moment of birth. If they did, I don't know about you, my wife would have told them to get out. I need some time, right? <laughs> no visitors today, please. So, it, it, with the understanding that they show up in a house, that Mary and Joseph have moved into a home situation of some kind there in Bethlehem, that they have been settled in for a little while, that most likely they did not show up on the night of the birth, that they showed up either a few weeks later or quite possibly as much as a year to two years later. Why do we think two years at most? Because Herod makes a decision based on what he hears from the wise men. He makes a decision to kill every child two years old and under. It could have been that they showed up in a time frame that Herod believes they, it, that took them almost two years to get there. And so he's going to eliminate every child in that two-year range. Right? Now, 
Nowhere does it say in the Bible that they showed up on this particular date. It just says they came to visit the child. What we also know, though, is it must have happened after it must have happened after Mary and Joseph take Jesus to the temple to dedicate him. Because Mary and Joseph buy two turtle doves, the offering for a poor person. If they'd have had money, they could have bought a better gift to have sacrificed for Jesus' dedication. So that means they don't have the gold yet. At least that's the assumption being made by scholars, that if they'd have had the gold they would have bought a better sacrificial gift at Jesus' dedication. But instead, they buy a pauper's gift, two turtle doves. We find that in Leviticus chapter 12 and laid out in the following chapters of Jesus, the account of Jesus' birth. So, whoever they are, whoever these individuals are, whoever these travelers are, who have been chronicled down through history, this is actually a, uh, the previous image, I'm sorry, the previous image there, is, uh, if you can take me back uh, a moment, can you do that? There we go. This is actually an icon from the Orthodox Church. It is ancient, somewhere around the 4th or 5th century. Um, icons, the unique thing about icons is that you, the only way you can print or, or paint an icon is if you have the image from its original context. It's the only way you can do it. You can't, it's not, this is not free base. <laughs> you can't make up your own stuff, right? You have to paint exactly what was painted before. And so the thought process is that this actually represents what these people really did look like. That's the neat thing about icons and their like. The next image, uh, go ahead and take me to that next one. This is from the 5th century. This is from um, a mural that we archaeologically discovered. These are, little, these are little tiles, right? Little squares that were put together on the floor at, to, to flesh out the image of the three wise men. So this three thing goes way back, by the way. This is 5th century. This is, there's some really, but, but here's what we know. Whoever these guys are, they have some power. They have some authority behind them. Remember, they are representing kingdoms. How do we know that? Because they, when they go to Herod, Herod could have had the possibility of just eliminating the three of them. Tell me where he's at, and then he could kill them. It was not beyond Herod's capability of killing an individual who brought bad news. And bad news to Herod was that there was another king who had been born, right? So he, he allows them to live for some reason. He didn't want to upset the kingdoms from which they came. And they told Herod that not only do we come to see this Jesus, this new king, we, we have come to worship him. Where is the newborn king of the Jews, verse 2 says? We saw the star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. Just not pay homage. Just not recognize the birth of the king. It's, this is not an honorary visit. This is not where, well, we're just showing, hey, the, the king next door had a baby. Let's go say hi. No, this is... This is an event of worship for these individuals. This is different. And it says that they bowed down. When they got into his presence, they bowed down. The posture of one who is worshiping is to bow, right? I mean, that's our understanding. That's why we hold the, the thought process of bowing with reverence, because you just don't bow to anything or anyone. You bow to that which you believe is more important, that which you believe has power or honor in your life. It says throughout Scripture that the posture of a believer is to bow before the Lord. King Solomon bowed in, down in worship at the dedication of the temple. In Psalm 95, verse 6, it says, Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. And doesn't Scripture tell us that at, at one day every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord? That's the posture they take at that moment because these magi believed. This is your first teaching note. I know it took me a while to get here because I'm excited about this. I love talking about these guys. But these magi believed that this child was an important king, an important king, not just any child. This child was a king of significance. This was not just any king. This is a king who will rule 
all kings. When a kingdom sends a messenger to bow down before another king, it's the recognition that you have power over my kingdom, that you one day will rule over my kingdom, that you are, your significance is greater than my own, and I will recognize you as a powerful and mighty king in our life and in our world and in our kingdom. Okay, so, so what do they do? They bring him gifts. To, to recognize his position, the position of Jesus in the world as, as a, an important king, they bring him gifts. So what's the deal with these gifts, right? What is the deal with gold, frankincense, and myrrh? Is this just, enough, uh, just an incidental aspect of the narrative of the story of, of Jesus' birth? Or is there something more going on? Is there something going on that, that we on the surface don't see? Seems like nice gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. What are they? I mean, we know what gold is, but what's frankincense and myrrh, and why did they bring these gifts? Well, if you, when, when you start digging in a little bit, you discover that they bring these gifts as symbols of who Jesus is. Your next teaching notes. Let's fill these blanks in for a moment. So they bring these gifts as symbols of who Jesus is and what he will do. These gifts represent the life of Jesus. They are important when you start peeling back what these gifts mean. They represent who Jesus is and what he will do in his life. So let's dive into the first one. The first one is gold. We all know what gold is. We know what gold means in our day, and we know most likely what it meant in ancient days because it means the exact same thing. It's, a, it's an item of power. It's an item of wealth. Gold is a necessary tribute that you pay to, to a, a king. It says that King Solomon, King Solomon had a throne made of gold. A throne made of gold. It's made of 500 shields of gold. I don't know how big a shield is, but I can only imagine the size of a shield of gold. 500 of them. He had drinking vessels made of gold, King Solomon was a sign of his wealth. This, the king, queen of Sheba brought gold and presented it to King Solomon like he needed more, right? But that's what you did if you recognized a king of power in your life, a, a king who had the ability to control your future, you brought him gold. You see what the wise men are doing here? They're saying to Jesus, you have the power to control my future. You have the ability to call the shots in my life. King David receives gold in his life. Gold is, is a clear sign of, of a kingdom being present among us. And even though he's just a baby, they believe that one day he will rule and that they need to let this baby know that he is important and that he is significant and that they recognize his status in the world. The gold is a sign for us that laying in that manger is King Jesus, king of the world, that, that, that everything that is here is a sign of the kingdom to, yet to come. So that's the gold piece, right? That's, that's gold, and we get that. Most, most of us understand that. We all know what it's like to pay taxes. We all take our gold and we give it to the government, which is hopefully not our king, right? We took care of that problem over 200 years ago, it was called the American Revolution. Feel free to read about it. Right. Got rid of that king. So that's gold. So what about these other two things, frankincense and myrrh? Let's dive into those for a second. Second, this frankincense, which is a fragrant, um, again, I'm giving you lots of information here, right? You're, it's kind of information overload, but, but it's important for us to get this information so we can look into it and and peel back what's happening. It's a fragrant white gum produced from certain trees found only in the land of Sheba, as we find in Isaiah chapter 60 and Jeremiah chapter 6. It's used uh, till this very day. It's still used in incense and in perfumes. It's pungent. In the Old Testament, the high priest would mix it together with other, other fragrances and burn this, I, these items together as an incense up to God so that God would smell the, the worship of the people. Frankincense is said to have 
uh, the qualities that help heal wounds and scars and fight off colds and flus when it's in your presence. I don't know about you. Uh, we have one of these um, diffusers in the office. Uh, somebody gave me a diffuser, and, and it, you put water in it, and then you put a couple drops of this stuff in, and it, it helps eliminate colds in the air. You know, it's kind of like um, airborne. You know, if you're going to get on a plane with a bunch of people who are sick, you're going to want to take something, right? Well, we have one of those happening. Well, frankincense has that ability to bring healing to people's lives. And, and he, so when you start peeling back what frankincense means, there's this, this powerfully strong suggestion that, that maybe the wise men didn't realize by bringing frankincense they were bringing incense, but what they were bringing was a recognition that one day this king would also be a healer to bring healing to the wounds and to the souls of people. That he would bring a healing power with him. That he would bring the ability to, to restore people to physical health, to correct physical defects, to take the blind and give them sight, to take the lepers and make them clean. That's what he is going to do in his life. And this frankincense represents the healing power of this king. You see, maybe they didn't even realize what they were doing. We get the gold, but now we get the frankincense. How about the, how about the myrrh? Because frankincense is a, a thing of healing, but what does the myrrh do? A myrrh is also an incense, incense or a spice. It is from trees that grow in Arabia, Ethiopia, Kenya, and Somalia. We still harvest myrrh today, but it was used as far back as 3000 BC by Egyptians in embalming. It was part of the embalming act of Egyptians 3,000 years ago. And like frankincense, it's a component of the incense used in temple worship by the priests. It's one of the things that is mixed in and burned to give off a, a, a perfume. It says in Exodus chapter 30 that, that myrrh is to be used. In the Song of Solomon, which if you ever want some really spicy reading... Feel free to go there. Um, Song of Solomon, it says that myrrh is mentioned as a perfume. And the Romans actually valued myrrh as one of the greatest perfumes to be used. Myrrh is, as, a, as a flavoring or an embalming or a narcotic is found oftentimes in the death and burial of individuals. You see where this is going, right? They bring myrrh as an incense, but it's also used... As John 19 tells us, Nicodemus brings all the mixture of spices of myrrh and aloes to prepare the body of Jesus once he is laid in the tomb. Myrrh is a symbol of what this king will do. He will one day give his life for all of us. He is being prepared for his death in the presence of this particular gift, the gift of myrrh. It says that when Jesus was on the cross, myrrh was mixed with wine to deaden the pain of the cross. He will suffer for the world. Myrrh is a symbol that Jesus will give his life for the world. He's being prepared. He's being called the king, the healer, and the one who will give his life for all of us. You see, these wise men, maybe these gifts weren't as silly as we think they are, or useless as we think they are. Yes, I think if, if it were wise men, women, they'd have brought different gifts. If it were me, I, I, I love to get those bouncy things. You hang in the doorway, you know, you put the child in and the child kind of bounces. You know, I, I think those are great. That's what I'd have brought. But not these guys. There's something going on here. It's much deeper than the bouncy thing in the doorway. It's a recognition of who Jesus is. Maybe this year, the gift of the Magi should mean something more to us. A recognition of who Jesus is and what he will do. Not just in his birth, but in his life and in his death. Because you see, he was born to die. He will give his life for all of us. I don't know if these guys knew that or not. But in their gifts, they recognize there's something about this king. There's something about this Jesus. And I wonder if we shouldn't think about how we give our gifts to this king. 
the gifts of our lives, the gift of our skills and our abilities, the gift of our finances, the gift of the, the resources that we've been given. We've been given so much. So let me just ask you the question. Our next teaching note is just a blank. I will bring what gift to the king? I will bring my life. I will bring my resources. I will bring my devotional life, my devotional time. What will you bring to the king to recognize his position in your life as the king of kings and the lord of lords, as the healer, and as the one who will die to give you eternal life? What gifts will you bring to the king? I think it's important for us to consider that this morning as, as we look at these wise men who brought some pretty wise gifts to tell us exactly who Jesus is. And I think we need to honestly consider what gifts we're bringing this king every single day. You and I have gifts. We've been given an amazing set of skills and abilities and talents. And Jesus asks us, will you give your gifts to me and share them with the world around you? My prayer is that you will do just that. So let's pray about that. God, we, we are inspired by the gifts that you brought. We are, we are amazed that you were orchestrating those gifts. That surrounding the birth of your son, you made sure that the gifts that were brought represented what he was going to do. Who he is going to be. And who he will be forever. Lord, may our gifts, may what you have given to us, may, may we not spoil them, use them unwisely. But like these wise men, will we step into a place of wisdom using the gifts we have to honor you, to recognize you as king of kings, the healer of our lives and souls, the healer of the world, and the savior of all. May we do that every single day with the gifts of, of talent and ability, the, the jobs we have, the resources we have, like our homes and, and our finances and our automobiles and all the things that we have, all the stuff that you've given us, Lord. May we use all of those gifts for your glory, for your honor, as we bow down and worship you. May our gifts be signs of our worship and our recognition of just exactly who you are. We pray all this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen.